Uh, good evening. I'm Noel Latif, uh, president of the Foreign Policy Association, and I'd like to welcome you to this uh, very special meeting. Uh, we meet today against the backdrop uh, of the scourge of war, which uh, again is bringing untold sorrow to millions of innocent people. Uh, for the Foreign Policy Association, which was founded on Armistice Day 1918 to promote a more peaceful world order, uh, the invasion of Ukraine is a, by a blatant violation of the United Nations uh, Charter uh, that calls for strong condemnation. Indeed, on a personal note, I'd like to say, Mr. Putin, stop this war. You are turning your country into another North Korea. We're very fortunate to have with us this evening from Washington, Ambassador Roman Papaduk, who served as the first United States envoy to Ukraine uh, and for many years was the chairman of our sister organization, the World Affairs Councils of America. And from Little Rock, uh, he will be joining us shortly, uh, General Wesley Clark, who served as Supreme Allied Commander Europe, uh, and I'm proud to say is a recipient of the Foreign Policy Association Medal. And with me, uh, Dr. Richard Andres, who is Professor of National Security Strategy at the U.S. Army War College, uh, and who has advised the Director of the National Security Agency uh, and the U.S. Cyber Command. Gentlemen, welcome. I'd like to turn to Ambassador Papaduke uh, to launch our discussion. Okay. Roman? No, good evening to you and to all your assembled guests there. Sorry I could not join you in person. Uh, it's a sorry state in which we uh, meet today, given the conflict that's ongoing in Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainian people are putting up a valiant struggle, and we hope that uh, tonight's discussion will shed some light on the processes there and also stimulate greater interest and support of that effort on the part of the Ukrainian people. So with that, I think, uh, Noel, I'd like to take just a few minutes to kind of outline the backdrop of how this conflict may have come about, et cetera, so we could have a foundation or a platform from which we could proceed in uh, the presentation by the other panelists and then into our Q&A session. So having said that, there are two issues that come to mind when we look at today's conflict. Uh, how did we get here? And what is Putin's motivation, so to speak? And one of the things that we find often in our discussions in the public fora is people say that it was the expansion of NATO that stimulated Russia to undertake this action. Uh, I would say it goes a little bit beyond that. I don't think NATO in itself as such had anything to do with it. And the reason I say that, I think the whether NATO had existed or not and whether NATO had expanded or not, I think there'd still be this drive by the Russians to take over Ukraine. And I say that for a variety of reasons. Number one, as a totalitarian state, uh, Russia greatly fears any semblance of the growth of democracy on its borders. And you've seen that Ukraine has been developing as a democracy over the years. It has a few shortcomings, obviously, like any new state does, but it has been developing as a democracy and has been moving to, toward the West. Those two issues pose a direct threat to the type of authoritarian structure that exists in Russia and that Putin would like to continue to maintain. Um, an, another issue you have to keep in mind is that um, there's a historical slash cultural uh, issue involved here for the Russians. Uh, Ukraine, the Kievan Rus, which is the uh, birthplace of Ukraine, is also serves as the ancestral roots to both societies. Kievan Rus is the area from which sprang the Muscovy state after the Tartars took over Kiev. Uh, the, there was a movement of people to the north and Muscovy developed in there for Russia. I don't want to get too much in the history of all this, but there are ancestral roots there. Also, you have to realize that at the same time, um, Christianity arose in Ukraine. So Ukraine was both the center of the ancestral birth of both people, so to speak, and as well as of Christianity. So there's a historical cultural mix in the Russian perspective 
of Ukraine and the desire to control Ukraine. Another issue that I think uh, people have to take into mind is the Russians kind of consider geography as part of their defense of nature. In this age of technology, geography really doesn't seem to play much of a role in, in, uh, in defense. Uh, with the technology we have with missiles, et cetera, geography is largely irrelevant. But in the Russian psyche, geography does still maintain a hold in their defensive approach to their society. So um, for them, it was important. And if you look at the history of Russia, for example, if you look at Napoleon's invasions and then the uh, German Nazi invasions in World War II, geography played a key role in defending the country and in defeating the invading forces. Geography, as well as the long and harsh winters that are associated with that, uh, with that part of the world. So those are key features in the kind of background for the uh, Russian mentality. Now, having said all that, uh, what, what I'm trying to say is basically this argument that has been going on that NATO expansion led the Russians to undertake this. What I'm trying to argue is that there were other issues. There were historical defensive issues, there were historical and cultural issues, and there was the threat of democracy as uh, Putin saw it and Ukraine's movement toward the West, uh, which would undermine his society. Now, the other issue that's been very much in the forefront uh, in, in mostly in the recent uh, few days is uh, the, whether Putin is acting in a rational manner. Uh, is he mentally unbalanced? Is he erratic? And, or is he physically ill? I'm not a psychiatrist, psychologist, or medical doctor, so I wouldn't want to pass judgment on that. But I would say uh, he's, from, he's acting from a historical perspective that is something that dovetails perfectly with the society that he operates. And that is that he's not, I don't think he's psychologically unbalanced. He's got a vision that is based on past Russian national history. Now, what I mean by that is to say that um, the view of Ukrainians from the Russian perspective has been one that Ukraine doesn't exist. I think the classic statement was his July article this last year, where he exposed the position that Ukraine is an artificial country, its geography was put together artificially, its people are really not the peoples, they're brothers of Russia, they're, they're part of the Russian fold, and that uh, to talk about Ukraine as an independent country is a fallacy, or kind of summarizing his point of view. What I'm, gonna, what I'm positing is that this is not a view that an individual holds. This kind of view kind of uh, goes through the strata of a lot of Russian nationalists, a lot of intellectuals in the Russian elite, and probably put through a, cross, a large spectrum of the Russian population to a great extent. So this is not something that's very unique to Putin, nor is it an erratic type of behavior. It may be a distorted view of history, but that's a national distortion from their perspective. And the reason I say that is if you look at the history of the Ukrainian Russian peoples, Back in the 1870s, under the Tsars, the Russians uh, outlawed the use of the Ukrainian language, for example. And during the Soviet period, it was the Ukrainians that were the focus of all the um, efforts by the KGB and security services and, and the authorities to undermine any growth of nationalists throughout the Soviet Union. So the Ukrainians were the focus of those efforts. And then if you look in the 1930s under the Soviet regime with the artificial uh, uh, famine that was instituted, to break the back of the Ukraines, uh, there were anywhere from four to six million people that died during that artificial famine. So these kinds of activities against the Ukrainian people are things that have taken place in the past, a desire to break their identity, a desire to break them physically. And what we see is uh, part of that history that's ongoing right now. So this, I, I think uh, from those two perspectives, the NATO side, as I mentioned, as well as the uh, Russian uh, view of the of Ukraine uh, kind of fits this kind of mold that's been taking place all, over the centuries from the Russian perspective. Now, having and that, what underlines all of this is con the concept that the Russians have of Novorossiya. If you can picture a map of Ukraine mentally for yourself right now and swing the arc from Kharkiv all the way down to the south around toward Odessa, 
and everything east of that arc was historically considered Novorossiya, in other words, New Russia, as they say. And this is something Putin has spoken about quite a bit. So if you look at the current war, it's basically a war to retake what they view or Putin views as Novorossiya. Uh, obviously, the Ukrainians don't view it that way. I don't view it that way. Uh, these are lands that have been uh, Ukrainian for many years, subjugated by the Russians. Uh, and this is a conflict uh, over these kind of cultural and historical differences that uh, the Russians have with the Ukrainian people. That's unfortunate. So that kind of lays the foundation of what has brought the, the genesis of this conflict, I think, uh, Noel. And I think this is something that um, over time will dissipate as things go on. As you realize, you know, you, uh, Russia is a, um, is a um, authoritarian state, obviously. Uh, and I would like to just make uh, the point that as an authoritarian state, uh, the individual doesn't matter in it. What matters is the state, the control of the state. And historically, Russia has been in an, author an authoritarian state from Tsarist times forward. There have been swings in the pendulum. Uh, Peter the Great, for example, the opening to the West, Gorbachev's Perestroika. There's been swings from the authoritarianism to kind of liberal liberation or, you know, move toward democracy. What you're seeing right now is after Perestroika was under Putin, a swing back to the old nationalist uh, authoritarian type of structure. Now, each swing of the pendulum brings you, uh, Russia, I think, closer and closer toward more reform. Hopefully, this after this swing, there'll be a fall of this regime and Russia will move closer and closer toward democracy. But we're a, little, uh, we're a long way from that at this stage of the game. We're in the middle of that swing of the pendulum right now. In terms of the current conflict, Noel, uh, one thing comes to mind very uh, clearly to me. We look at the Russian forces right now. A lot of people talk about the Russian forces being bogged down, et cetera, moving slowly. Yes, there is good resistance by the Ukrainians and the Russian forces are being bogged down in certain cases, but they are moving forward in a slow, plotting way. This is kind of the Slavic way of approaching things. I, I like to say, you know, we in the West would take like a fly swatter to kill a fly. The Russian military would take a sledgehammer. They do everything in a huge brute force. And this is what you're witnessing right now. But part of the Slavic culture is one of patience and forbearance. And you see that in the Russian psyche, but you also see that in the Ukrainian, on the Ukrainian side. The Ukrainians are going to fight and they will fight no matter what, whether it comes down to a all out war as it's going on now or as a guerrilla conflict. There's a certain persistence among Slavs and Ukrainians very much uh, have that persistent, persistence in their character. And we're looking for a very, very difficult time ahead for the Ukrainian people, but a, a fight that uh, obviously is worthwhile taking, taking on because they're fighting for their freedom and we'll see how things evolve. But I have optimism and I'm very optimistic about what uh, the Ukrainians will be able to achieve. With that, I'll just uh, turn it over to you now. Yeah, uh, Roman, could I follow up and ask you, what is sure. your appraisal of the Biden administration's handling of the crisis? Well, I, you know, I'm a little disappointed in the sense of uh, what we have been doing as a, as a country. We've given a very good rhetorical support of what uh, uh, we believe in uh, terms of the fight that the Ukrainians are undertaking. We've been very much in favor of supporting them verbally, et cetera. We've taken a number of actions, all of which I support. I'm a little disappointed in the sense that we haven't been able to implement broader sanctions. And here I'm talking about the energy sector. That is the sector that is most uh, glaringly um, important to the Russians. And I think it would be very important for us to undertake that action. And even in the SWIFT uh, payment system, no, uh, we've taken an, undertaken some actions against key banks we haven't included all the banks under that umbrella, I believe, at this time. When you're going to do something, you got to do it uh, right away, and you got to do it in a strong way to show the strength of, of the process. You can't do it piecemeal and then have them find loopholes or find ways to go around uh, the certain sanctions. So I, I think the administration can do a lot more and a lot better in terms of applying the force of the sanctions uh, particularly on the energy sector right now. Richard, uh, there's concern that uh, Mr. Putin will retaliate against uh, economic sanctions by unleashing um, 
cyber attacks against financial institutions. What are his capabilities and do you think there is a willingness to engage in, in cyber warfare at this point? Uh, this, is, this has been the big question recently, is why have we not seen more cyber attacks coming out of uh, Russia? Uh, and it's, it's, been a, it's been a bit of a puzzle, but I, I, don't, I don't think it needs to be, really. And predicting what Putin is thinking and how he's going to use this, uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's impossible. Uh, in the first point, Putin is very afraid of escalation, right? If he just fights Ukraine, he's, he'll win, right? There's, there's virtually no question that he will get what he wants. He may not be happy with trying to hold on to Ukraine, once he gets it, but he will get it, uh, as long as we don't intervene. And so right now, I suspect what Putin is thinking is, all right, at what point do I need to turn on some pain for the United States? And the threat that he made was that if we disconnected Russia from SWIFT, uh, that he would retaliate. And I thought the, uh, the president, well, the Europeans were very smart in the way they did not disconnect Russia entirely from SWIFT. They partially disconnected some banks from SWIFT, which circumvented his threat. So he didn't retaliate. Now, if we do something that escalates it far enough that Putin feels like he has to retaliate, and I don't know what that would be exactly, but you can probably use your imagination. If he decides that he has to retaliate, my guess is that he will use cyber as his primary means of doing so. Uh, over the last 10 years, 20 years, Russia has made a point of infiltrating U.S. critical infrastructure to a, a very, very large extent. The Russians are in everything. They're very good at what they do. And we've seen some, some veiled threats recently. For instance, the Colonial Pipeline uh, takedown I mean, it was a criminal organization acting out of Russia, but really there was very little question that, that the government was behind the colonial pipeline takedown. And there have been some other attacks on infrastructure in the United States recently, which are plausibly deniable, but really we all know that the Russian government is behind, or at least it could stop what's happening. These are very small signals to the United States, and we've had the commander of uh, U.S. Cyber Command come out, and in Senate testimony, he said that these guys could take down the U.S. electric grid if they want to. Uh, the director of national intelligence a few years back said, we're living in a glass house. And he said again in Senate testimony that we are very afraid of Russia. Now, that was one of the least cautious things that a director of national intelligence could ever say in a public forum, but he said it. So. And oh, by the way, I need to specify, I, I should have done this when I first started talking. It, uh, I, I'm speaking as an individual tonight. I, I don't represent the Department of Defense in any way. This is Professor Andrus, uh, not in any official capacity. Uh, Professor Andrus, uh, can we get back to what the Russians might do to in Ukraine in terms of their energy grid? Uh, Ukraine has a number of nuclear reactors. Uh, is there a risk that they will do something vis-a-vis uh, -vis those reactors? There was a lot of concern early on, but probably misplaced. And the reason for that is cyber capabilities are, uh, you, you can do a lot with them, but you can do a lot more and a lot faster with a, kin a kinetic weapon, right? So you can do a lot of damage with a cyber attack on a, a nuclear reactor or on a pipeline or on whatever it is. They, they, in previous years, they've taken down the Ukrainian electric grid twice, I mean, temporarily, but they did it twice. It's just hard to do, and it tends to be temporary. And if you have a missile, you can do it a lot faster. So spending the resources and the time to take down a nuclear reactor in Ukraine with cyber would be really a waste of effort, and it would probably give away some of their capabilities, which they do not want to give away. So I, I'm not surprised that they have not used a lot of these capabilities in Ukraine, um, and I don't expect to see many, as long as they have troops on the ground there. Now, if you want to talk about the United States, right, you've, you've seen that Russian apparently criminal attacks have been ramping up on U.S. banks over the last few days, but it hasn't been severe. It's been more like a symbolic warning look, we're, st we're still here, don't forget about this. It has not been very serious, though, in my estimation. I'd like to invite our chairman, uh, Henry Fernandez, who's with us this evening, uh, and who's also the chairman of MSCI, to update us on this recalibration of the uh, Russia indexes uh, at MSCI. Do we have a, a microphone? 
where do you want me to stand? Or uh, but just there? right here. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you, Noel. So when I'm not working with Noel on the Foreign Policy Association, my day job is uh, to run the largest uh, investment tools company in the world. And that, what that company does is uh, it helps create uh, a lot of different mechanisms by which global markets are connected between the providers of capital and the users of capital around the world. So clearly, the Russian crisis uh, in Ukraine created you know, all the financial, all the uh, sanctions, and, and it, they affected severely the functioning of, of the capital markets, uh, not only the banking market, but the capital markets of, of Russia. So what, uh, one of the things that MSCI does is um, we're the equivalent of a gatekeeper or a connector between those providers of capital uh, and, and the, their investments in, um, in, a, in a lot of countries around the world. Uh, and one of our product line is uh, equity indices, which serve as guides uh, as to um, you know, how investors put their money to work. Uh, some of that is uh, more like a, a guy, and some of that is exact replication of what we do. So there are about $16 trillion of assets that are following you know, what we do, uh, and about $5 trillion of that is exact replication of what we do. So when, when the Moscow uh, exchange uh, shut down, uh, therefore there was no way for uh, people to buy or sell uh, Russian securities, uh, and uh, we mobilized immediately to determine what was the best course of action. Um, so when we're in the middle of that, then the, uh, a lot of what is called clearing houses that provide the settlement of securities uh, in, in, in the West and in, in Europe decided that they were not going to allow the buying and selling. Uh, well, they could allow the buying and selling, but not the settlement of the, security, the, the uh, Russian securities that trade in London. So, um, so a lot of those uh, secur securities ended up uh, going down to almost zero, you know, in value. Um, you know, so Luke Oil and Gazprom, which is the big, uh, the big uh, gas company, uh, is Berber Bank, which is the largest bank in the country. So, so what we did was uh, yesterday we decided to uh, eject all Russian securities from uh, these indices. And therefore, uh, pretty much every market participant, when they're able to uh, transact, you know, in those securities, they will be forced to sell them, you know, uh, in mass. If the markets had been open, that would have represented about 35, tri uh, 35 billion dollars of outflows, um, a minimum of 35 billion dollars of outflows uh, from uh, from Russia uh, into other markets. So, um, so we took decisive action, you know, uh, and that's at this point irreversible uh, for a long time to come. So de facto, the Russian equity markets are completely pariahs. You know, they're completely out of the, uh, of the uh, global equity markets uh, of the world. Another part of what we do is we create what we call ESG ratings, uh, that is environmental, social governance uh, ratings of companies and countries around the world. So in this case, uh, we had to evaluate what was the ESG rating of the, the country itself. Uh, so we met Sunday and decided that we were going to uh, take it to the next to lowest level. Uh, these are similar but very different from credit ratings. But these also serve as guides as to people that have certain values and principles on, on how they invest, whether they want to you know, put their money in a company or in a country based on govern, governance criteria and environmental criteria like climate change or, or social criteria. So they were, uh, they were rated triple B, not the highest, but they were you know, middle of the road because of a lot of the government, governance and social issues of the country. And the lowest rating is a triple C, so we uh, put them down to, uh, to single B. We also downra downgraded uh, Belarus uh, to single B for their complicity. Uh, to that, so that's another indication that when the bond markets open and the equity markets open, uh, they're going to be in a category uh, uh, very low. Now, we potentially could downgrade it to triple C, and there are only countries like Venezuela, and Syria, and uh, 
uh, is a handful of countries that are in an extremely uh, you know, level of uh, low governance. That, um, so that could happen, but you know, it's still on watch. So anyhow, so uh, these are all technical you know, issues, but this is the flow of the capital markets and the finance markets you know, of the world. And it's just a representation of, uh, of uh, how much of an economic pain they're going to have you know, in the country when, uh, when a country doesn't have access to the uh, finance markets you know, around the world, the equity markets around the world. Uh, they cannot defend their currency because there are sanctions against the central bank. Sooner or later, that's going to have a major you know, impact uh, on their economy. So we have, in our organization, we have no doubt that uh, this is going to be a severe impact in the, uh, in the functioning of the country and the GDP of the country. Uh, it's going to take some time, maybe uh, not, not in time uh, to be able to prevent a takeover of the country by the uh, Russian forces, but for sure that Russia is going to pay a severe price economically and financially. Uh, because of these actions. Thank you very much, Henry. I, I'd like to go back, Roman, to your observation that there could be a uh, protracted insurgency. Uh, do, you, do you think the Russians are prepared for that? And uh, uh, what, what do you see as the long-term U.S. foreign policy posture? Are we going back to containment and, and, and uh, uh, another Cold War? Sure, no, that's all very legitimate and good questions. But I'd like to go back, if you don't mind, take the opportunity to touch a little bit on the nuclear issue that Richard and you had discussed earlier. Uh, we talk about, uh, you know, the nuclear capability, well, not nuclear capability, but uh, uh, nuclear reactors in Ukraine. People have to realize there are four nuclear reactors in Ukraine, in Zaporizhia, the town of Zaporizhia, as the largest nuclear reactor, I believe, in Europe. So there's a lot of nuclear material in Ukraine. But you don't have to have a, a kinetic attack on the on it right now. For what I was told earlier today, and I don't know how true it is, but I'll just share it with the audience, is that the movement of Russian tanks from Belarus through the Chernobyl zone is kicking up a lot of the dirt and dust, which has the nuclear material in it that had been laying, for lack of a better term, dormant over the years. And that's being kicked up into the air. So who knows what kind of contamination is coming forth as a result of the you know, those tanks moving in trucks and forces moving across the border through that zone. So there may be a, a nuclear issue already, a contamination issue spreading right now. I'm not a scientist. I can't give you a judgment on that. And I don't know how accurate those reports are, but that's what I understand right now. And uh, outside of that, of course, is the, the kinetic attack. If it ever hits one of those reactors, uh, there could be m multiple problems. In, ter in terms of your specific questions, uh, Noel, um, uh, the Ukrainians have made it quite clear that they're going to be willing to fight and will continue to fight for their country. You see this in a number of ways. You see that uh, there are people returning from Ukraine, I mean, uh, back into Ukraine, from out, outside of Ukraine. The young men are coming back to Ukraine to, to fight. Uh, you see that in the sense of the President Zelensky being very defiant in terms of the, uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, exhorting the Ukrainians to continue to fight. So I think the motivation is very much there. And I think the, uh, the size of the country in itself is going to be very important for the Ukrainians to be able to support, sustain this kind of attack over, over time, uh, uh, attack against the Russians in terms of guerrilla warfare. So yes, I do see it. In terms of foreign policy, um, uh, obviously uh, we're in a different world now than we were, let's say six months ago. We are definitely in a Cold War, for lack of a better term, with the Russians right now. Uh, the ball's in the Russians' court in terms of how they want to proceed beyond this and how they want to solve the uh, uh, Ukraine issue. Uh, it could be settled today through a negotiation that the Ukrainians have been willing to uh, undertake with the Russians. Uh, so it's up to the Russians how they want to uh, settle this. Putting that aside, from our perspective, I can see us trying to build uh, a, an insurgency in Ukraine. We made it quite clear that we'd be supporting that insurgency, that we'd be supporting Ukraine in its continuing battle. Uh, I think you see that in, both in terms of the various governments that are sending arms to Ukraine. And at the same time, you see that by a great number of individual, uh, individual organizations around the world that are, are sending support, uh, mostly humanitarian support to Ukraine. 
But uh, so I, I, I see this as a long term uh, foreign policy issue for for the United States on that front, but also a, it's a very key foreign policy issue in, in the sense of NATO. You see uh, that we are back back to rejuvenating NATO as a strong organization. Uh, we are redeploying some extra forces to the theater there to show our resolve, both in terms of the face of, in the face of Russian aggression, as well as to to uh, uh, make our allies more comfortable knowing that uh, our defense can be relied upon. And the president made it quite clear by saying that we will not give one inch of NATO territory. So we are definitely in a new environment, uh, whether we call call a cold war or whatever uh, war we want to call it, uh, we are in a confrontation with Russia and in a battle. Ukraine is going to serve as the theater of that battle for the short term, and NATO is going to be the backbone of sustaining freedom and democracy in Europe as well as around the world. So we're definitely in a new world right now in terms of our relationship with Russia. Uh, Putin has engaged in some nuclear saber rattling, Richard, uh, and I get asked the question all the time, you know, is this going to escalate? Uh, should we be concerned about getting uh, fallout shelters again and getting back into that mentality? How, how, how do you think uh, uh, the U.S. response has been uh, and uh, are, are there risks of, of some kind of escalation here? Yeah, I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked that because it's when you look at a war, so, so I, I've been involved in planning wars uh, for the last two, almost three decades. You know, I'm one of the folks they bring in. And then I have the privilege to go back and teach about all the mistakes that we made for the next two years at, at the National War College where, where I teach. Uh, so you know, it's an interesting job, honestly, because we make a lot of mistakes. This is one of those times it's very, very important we understand what kind of a war this is and what's going on. Because this is the most serious event we've had in 30 years. What kind of a war is this? This is a war between two major powers that have thousands of nuclear weapons. Everything else is kabuki. Everything else is kabuki. Thousands of nuclear weapons. So yes, we can push Putin, we can push Russia, and boy, they, they deserve it. They've got it coming, right? Not, not as much as the Soviets did, right? Not as much as a lot of other countries, but they've really got it coming. But, but if we push them too far, uh, Schelling, the, the philosopher of war, Thomas Schelling, called this, uh, uh, this type of war uh, a war of pain and suffering. Because you can't actually win it on the battlefield. You cannot win a war with a nuclear power like Russia. So what you do is you try to cause each other enough pain and suffering that eventually you start to back off. But if we cause too much pain and too much suffering for Russia, if we hurt their economy too much, if we, if we start a insurgency which threatens Putin's regime so that he's afraid that his, for his life, and Putin right now, I suspect, if he has any brains at all, he is very worried for his life because there's going to be some oligarch back there with a pistol. And he knows it. He makes a mistake. He's not going to live long. He, that's what he's worried about. That's what he keeps him up at night. So if we push him too far to the point where he feels like he has to do something, he is going to use nuclear weapons. Now, he has said he will use nuclear weapons. The Russian military doctrine calls for using tactical nuclear weapons against us. So they're planning to do it. They've told us they're going to do it. If we push them too far, they will do it. What is that going to look like if it happens? If we get into some sort of a big cyber dispute and we knock down their power grids, we knock out their dams, we, right? They're going to potentially start using small nuclear weapons where somewhere to make a signal to us to let us know what they're doing. And if we escalate and hit back, right? This, this is Cold War stuff. So you asked about what I think about Putin being, or rather about uh, President Biden being cautious. I am reluctant to evaluate my boss, but uh, I'll say that I'm, I'm glad that we have not contributed troops to this, uh, this fight. It's not that I don't want to. It's not that you know, our, folks, our, our folks at the National War College don't want to get into the fight. I'm sure they would. We can't get into a conventional war with a nuclear power on its doorstep. So I guess that would be my, my overall point. See, this war is what it is. This is a nuclear standoff, and we have to be cautious. Uh, uh, Richard, George Kennan, the um, author of Containment, um, 
uh, warned in an article uh, that appeared many years later under his signature uh, that if we moved NATO right up to Russia's border, there would be a second Cold War. Should the U.S. endgame be to enlarge NATO and to bring in Finland and, and, and whoever else uh, that is now concerned about uh, Russian uh, aggression? So I remember this debate back in the 90s. It was a, it was a hot debate. We could have gone either way. So, uh, you know, it's like crossing a gully. If you're going to cross a gully, there's two ways to get across. One is to take it really slow and cautiously and climb down one side and up the other. The other one is to go really fast where you'd run and you jump across it. The, the fast route would have been to push NATO up all the way up to the Russian borders right at the end of the Cold War when Russia was weak and pliable. The slow way would have been to take Kennan and Kissinger's advice and keep it slow. We took the middle course, right? We quickly ran up to the gully and jumped in. We it was the worst thing. We pushed NATO forward haphazardly to the point where Putin started saying, no, stop, we won't take this, right? And now here we are at this point where we're in the middle of the gully in deep, deep trouble. Um, because Putin has nuclear weapons, I think we probably ought to back down a little bit. I think we ought to give him his sphere of influence. I think there's a time to be really forceful and strong and aggressive, and that is not right now. Russia will lose in the long run. Their economy is shattered. Their, their population is aging. About the only thing they've got left going for, their, for them is the nuclear weapons. In the long run, Russia is not a threat in the long run. It is right now, though. It's a big threat because Putin's got his back against the wall. So let's, let's ease the pressure off a bit. This is you know, just my, my opinion on this. Uh, not too much. Let's make him, he's, he's paying a price. I understand his economy is predicted right now, uh, J.P. Morgan says, to contract 35% in the last year. That's a price. So let's, let's do that. But let's not expand NATO. Let's, uh, in fact, maybe the end game, I don't know what the end game here is, but maybe the end game is after Putin experiences enough pain, after the Russian economy collapses, after their energy markets are destroyed, maybe in a year or so, we make some under the table agreement that we won't expand NATO, uh, something like that. Thank you. Let's uh, open it up to, uh, for your questions. Uh, and we'll start with, with, with Henry. Oh, is, is, is General Clark with us? Oh, good, good, good. Uh, General I'm Clark, welcome. I understand you. you're, you're traveling from, from Denver to Little Rock. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, this is what modern technology uh, can, can enable. Uh, would you like to give us your assessment of the Biden administration's response? And what would you do differently? Well, OK, I'd be happy to. Um, I, I could talk for a long time. Do I have five minutes? Absolutely. OK, so let me say this, that I think the Biden administration strategy to begin with, which was to stabilize Russia and focus on China, may have been overly optimistic. Putin was never going to be a factor of stability. From the time he became prime minister in 1999, he announced that he wanted Ukraine. I was a NATO commander at the time, and the Poles came to me and said, this is very bad. He's going to try to take us over again. And so uh, he's put this plan in place over a period of many years. He's built the force. He's practiced it. This is a uh, escalate to de-escalate doctrine of the small nuclear weapon. Um, he's done it in his exercises. So we have no surprise about any of this. It was only a question of would he do it? And I think the administration wisely used the intelligence. They have won the information war to begin with, even though some of the Europeans and the Ukrainians themselves didn't want to admit that it was really going to happen. It did. So I give the president and the administration tremendous credit for the information war at the outset. They built an incredible sanctions effort, and we don't know how powerful it is really on Russia. Looks like it's going to be pretty strong. It may be overwhelmingly strong, and certainly it's making China sit back and take a second look at what its aggressive ambitions might be about Taiwan. So it could, although the president said in the press conference it wasn't supposed to stop the attack, it could stop the attack. We just don't know. In the meantime, what we have on the ground in Ukraine 
is a uh, really brilliantly executed under strength Ukrainian military defense against a highly mechanized, poorly trained Russian military. The Russian military also had the disadvantage of the weather. And that's what's really killed them on the avenue of approach north of Kyiv. They're simply roadbound. And that, that 40 mile long convoy is a big stack of vehicles that can't get off the road. They're running out of fuel. Uh, the troops have punctured some gas tanks. They're hearing what's happened. Some of the vehicles have been knocked out. It is really a mess. It will be sorted out eventually, but that 40 mile convoy right now is a distraction. Instead, what's happening is in the south, they're rolling up the Ukrainian forces. They're feeding replacements in through Crimea. They're coming across the Kurt Straits. They had a pretty good basis in Crimea anyway. They will come out of the Donbass. And the problem for the Ukrainians is, do they try to defend eastern Ukraine? Do they go to Kharkiv? Do they uh, go south and try to stop the actions along the uh, coastline? These are big, big operational moves. This is not tactics. It requires tremendous uh, coordination. It requires logistics and a whole lot of other things that Ukrainians have never practiced. But then neither have the Russians practiced it. So uh, neither side is adept at this. We're very good at it in our military because we saw what we had to do. We practiced it for years. We saw it in Desert Storm uh, in the early 90s, and we just got better and better at it. They're not. The Russians will get better. They've got a very capable officer corps and they will learn from this. The question is what's going to happen and how long can we wait? Can we wait a year? Can we wait until Putin is frustrated and decides just to use a nuclear weapon to get it over with? What if he puts a nuke on, on Kharkiv or chemical weapons? Do we say at that point, okay, okay. I mean, <laughs> you can have it. We don't know what we're going to do. And the problem is Putin thinks he's found a loophole in our nuclear deterrent strategy. We believe we had a strategic nuclear deterrent to be able to um, prevent a Soviet takedown of Western Europe. We knew we couldn't beat them with conventional forces. So we had tactical nuclear weapons, theater nuclear weapons, we called it linkage. And we went through a theater nuclear modernization crisis in the early 80s. We ended up with the zero, zero option when we agreed to, after a lot of anguish, to modernize. And then we got rid of all that. There are no Pershing twos. There's no Glickums anymore. There's no nuclear artillery. We didn't work on the enhanced radiation warhead. We still have our survivable strategic deterrent, but it doesn't have the on the ground linkage that we had during the Cold War. Russia, meanwhile, developed its enhanced radiation warhead and downsized it. And they have tactical nuclear weapons that can be artillery delivered anywhere on the battlefield and more effectively than any tactical nuclear weapon we ever had. Putin mistakenly believes he has the ability to deter us. We thought our deterrent would stop war from breaking out. He believes his deterrent will keep us from interfering with him if he decides to go to war. This is a conundrum that the administration finds itself in. How can it work its way through this strategic conundrum? Does it say it's too great a risk to challenge? Let, 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 let it play out. That's fine. But what is the consequence for NATO, for Taiwan, if you let it play out? What you've said is that any power that has nuclear weapons that could strike the US homeland is going to be given free reign up to some indefinable point. So when China says, I want Taiwan, we say, well, you can't have Taiwan. They said, no, no, it's part of our territory legally. You know, from 1949, it was always part of China. And if you interfere, we'll use nuclear weapons. We say, well, okay, well, let's think about that for a while. And then boom, or Iran or North Korea. The whole concept of extended U.S. deterrence is now under threat. Mm -hmm. And what we've said is that any tin pot dictator who wants to have his way get the capacity to strike the United States and will think twice about it. Now, Putin is not a tin pot dictator, but he is really 
he believes he's found a hole in our deterrent strategy. We don't seem to have an answer to it. We have to think this through. How would we do it? How do we get in there and cure? What we have to do is hope that you bring to the foul. Putin has to believe that he can keep us from reinforcing Ukraine enough to stay in, and he can take the punishment we provide. So, you know, my is on the one hand, all the weapons of international law and use them now. Why are, why graduate the sanctions? Only because it's so painful to us. But he's an international criminal. He started an aggressive war. Brand him an international criminal. Make him a pariah. Let the Russians understand that as long as he's the head of Russia, Russia can never be a normal state. They can never travel, and they're going to be like North Korea. We need to do it as rapidly as possible. Maybe they'll overthrow him. Beyond the international legal case, we need to do what we can to help Ukraine survive through this. What can we do? Well, we're trying to, you know, get in supplies and assistance. But what happens when Putin? What happens when Putin says? I'm tired of you people interfering in my Ukraine. The next time I see something going in, I'm going to use a nuclear weapon. Are we going to stop? So we have to think through these issues. I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that it's an urgent problem in a multipolar world to rethink how a major power like the United States that believes in a rules-based international system uses its power to support and extend that rules-based system. And I want to close with just one point, if I could. I was in a darkened hotel lobby in 2014, and a Ukrainian professor who had KGB ties came up to me and he said, I want to explain to you what happened with the Cuban Missile Crisis and why Russia is so dangerous. He said, you know, Russia lost the Cuban Missile Crisis. I said, I, don't, I didn't know that. Why? I think we didn't do very well. We had to give up our missiles in Turkey and, and, and Italy. He said, no. Khrushchev had promised the Politburo that if he got the missiles into Cuba, that he could force the United States to withdraw from Europe. Of course, he didn't get the missiles into Cuba. He said, but here's why. Because when it came eyeball to eyeball, it wasn't the great Kennedy diplomacy. It wasn't the naval quarantine. It was the fact that the United States had strategic nuclear superiority, which we did at that time. And had a nuclear war ever started, they could have lobbed six or 10 warheads at the United States and we could have come back with 600. They knew it and we knew it. Putin mistakenly believed that these hypersonics and this drone nuclear torpedo give him some kind of advantage. They don't. We still have a survivable nuclear deterrent based on a triad but we have to understand how to use it in a multipolar world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General Clark, um, uh, for flagging that uh, this unprovoked invasion is a game changer. Do you think that the, our European friends uh, have, have woken up uh, to this new geopolitical reality? They're very concerned. And of course, the closer you are to Russia, the more concerned you are. This is the way it, it's always been. And the United States has always been the sort of, I'm not so sure, Russia's a big country, et cetera, et cetera. Back um, when I was the NATO Supreme Allied Commander, it was the Europeans who said, look, uh, the Milosevic is starting ethnic cleansing again in the Balkans. And the United States view was, bro, well, we're preparing a war against Iraq and uh, we're worried about North Korea, mind your own business. But eventually the European perspective did pervade the United States. We took the appropriate action. We stopped ethnic cleansing. Milosevic is gone, especially after we indicted him as a war criminal. And on the 25th of May, 99, he was done. All during the Cold War, Europeans would, without, in my view, justification, question America's credibility as a reliable st strategic guarantor of their security. The question would come like, well, if the Russians come in and uh, they're overrunning Hamburg and you start using nuclear weapons, would you put New York at risk to save Hamburg? And this was bandied about 
off and on for years by various um, European politicians, and it was always satisfactorily answered. The question now facing us is, if you look at Ukraine and compare that to the other Eastern members of NATO, who's stronger, Ukraine or Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, who has the greater staying power in the fight? Looks like the toughest guy out there is Ukraine. They've been at war for eight years. They've got a large army. They're trained. Uh, they're the worst people the Russians could fight because they speak Russian. They know every Russian trick. Half of them went to Russian schools. But is the rest of Europe that tough and that strong? And what about the lack of strategic depth in the Balkans and the problem of Kaliningrad? So from the East European perspective, um, they're reliant on the United States, on strong American leadership, on the credibility of our guarantees, and on our strategic insights on how to deal with this problem. Are there risks? Yes. But um, I would say that it's a 1938-39 moment. It's a time when the West has to be proactive rather than passive. We have to think our way through the problem. We have to tell Putin he will not succeed. And we have to mean it and take the actions to make sure he does not Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to open it up to your better questions. Uh, if you would identify yourself uh, and ask a question, please. Hi, good evening. Uh, Tom Heptig, fantastic commentary. Uh, question around uh, de-escalation. The Ukrainians have certainly rallied to the point that regime change is, is probably unsustainable in the, in the immediate future. They wouldn't, they wouldn't support uh, anyone Putin would put in place, which then starts to lead into some protracted occupation, which we in the U.S. have learned can be painful, difficult, um, and, and very costly. At the same time, you have a character with a, with a large ego. What are the, what are the foreign policy uh, decisions we can make to show de-escalation and sort of allow him to save face uh, in, in lieu of a, a, protract, a protracted um, occupation? Well, we were discussing earlier the lack of off-ramps. Richard, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, well, let's keep the war between Ukraine and the Russians. If the Russians are foolish enough to try to occupy Ukraine, they're going to get what we got in Vietnam, they got in Afghanistan, the French got in Algeria, we got in Iraq. Occupying countries doesn't work very well these days, and if the Russians go that route, they're going to regret it. So let, let, them, let them do that. Let's just keep ourselves on the sidelines. The financial instrument is a great way to hurt the Russians. We are hurting them probably more than we could in a conventional military engagement. If we really have contracted or will contract their economy by 35 percent this year, that, that's pain, right? So let's, let's keep the military out of this. Let's use the financial instruments uh, of power to try to make them pay a price. Let's be careful not to push it too far to the point where Putin has nothing to lose. If he gets to the point where he has nothing to lose, well, you know, the, all bets are off. Next question. Uh, Dr. Paul Sheard. Oh, thank you very much. Paul Sheard from Harvard Kennedy School. and. Uh, Foreign Policy Association. Um, there hasn't been any or very much discussion so far about the diplomatic uh, possibilities and how we got here. Um, the Minsk Accords, you one and two. Um, the overture that Russia made in December to, which was in the form of a draft treaty, obviously an ambit claim, but really uh, talking about uh, indivisible security, uh, putting on the table proposals for uh, a, a reworking of the security architecture in Europe. The US came back with a response at the end of January, which it did not make public. And here we are a month, month and a half later in the situation. Um, in terms of off-ramps, and we've been talking a lot about nuclear weapons and things like that, what is the diplomatic kind of assessment and uh, 
prospects, if you like, for you know getting around the table. President Macron apparently spent an hour and a half on the phone with Putin today. It was a pretty tense conversation by all accounts. Um, but you know, what are, what are the diplomatic possibilities here to avert uh, some of the really horrendous kind of uh, hypotheticals that have come onto the discussion today and have been really a little bit shocking, to tell you the truth, to, to hear a, about the nuclear possibilities here? Uh, we, we had invited uh, Katerina Vanden Heuvel to join us, and uh, unfortunately she couldn't. But her um, op-ed in the Washington Post earlier this week uh, stresses the Mince Accords. She says the Mince Accords uh, uh, terms hammered out in 2015 but never implemented could offer the outlines of a settlement. They essentially guarantee Ukraine independence in exchange for neutrality. Uh, the intense diplomacy spurred by the crisis should also lead to new thinking about security. Could security focus first on building the cooperation needed to address pandemics and climate change? Could it create institutions that divert resources from the entrenched institutions of war? How do you react, Roman? Well, uh, two things uh, I would say. Uh, first of all, I think it's a very good question in terms of diplomacy. What is the status of diplomacy right now? As you know, there are ongoing talks, and we obviously want to be engaged somehow with the Russians to see if we could get an off-ramp, as people like to speak about. But you have to realize two things. First, the Minsk agreements, uh, they got stuck in the mud basically because of the process of how, how they will be implemented. And not to get too much into the weeds on this thing, but basically the Russians were using the Minsk agreements as a process by which uh, they would gain control of Donetsk and Luhansk at the expense of Ukraine. It's kind of the chicken or the egg first, whether the uh, accords will be implemented to give these areas a certain stature, and at what stage would the Ukrainians have get, regained possession of their border. So there was always that loggerhead that took place. No one could get uh, agreement on the sequencing. Do the, uh, does Luhansk and uh, uh, Donetsk get special status? Do the Ukrainians get the borders? When would the elections take place? Things of that nature. So that was really not moving anywhere over all these years. In terms of the reference to the January negotiations, basically, if I, if I read the, understood the question correctly, one of the problems there was that uh, the, what the Russians demanded was an outright uh, statement by the West that uh, NATO would not be extended to Ukraine and that uh, there will be no forward deployment of uh, NATO uh, equipment into those, into those regions, both of which were non-starters for the West. So you know the, the bar that the Russians have set, whether it's Minsk or with this latest round of negotiations about the, the uh, you know, expansion of NATO, or is just too high and it's giving them a veto over everything. So basically in, on those two levels, I think the negotiations are basically frozen at this time. Now they are, the Ukrainians and the Russians are still speaking, but obviously there's a lot to overcome. Right now in the bilateral negotiations, if you let me go a little bit further, the issue of uh, Ukrainian recognition at Crimea, for example, as belonging to Russia whether Ukraine would declare itself neutral. These are all issues that are out there and obviously they all fall on the Russian side as victories for them if you look at it from that perspective. It's all a loss in diplomacy for Ukraine right now in terms of what the Russians are willing to discuss. General Clark, would you like to weigh in? Um, I'd like to say a couple of things. First, I think it is really hard to find an off ramp for Putin. I think when he did this, he knew well what the consequences would be. He knew and anticipated what the reaction from the United States would be. And he does anticipate that at some point, the nations of the West will simply not be able to stand by and watch this happen. So I think we do have some off-ramp problems for Mr. Putin. I think he's you know, in for a dime, in for a dollar, and he's in this. And that's one of the reasons why we're uh, being so thoughtful about the response. I think in terms of the diplomacy that's associated with it, I'd like to make this point that NATO expanded only in response to the demands of the Europeans for protection against Russia. For example, in 1997, the Bulgarian foreign minister told me on my first trip to Bulgaria as NATO commander, she said, Russia's weak today, but someday it'll be strong again. Before then, we have to be in NATO. 
the Romanians the same, the Baltic states the same. They knew that Russia reclaimed them. And when I went to Russia, I led the first US-Russian staff talks and I had extensive conversations with Russian generals and diplomats in the time I was NATO commander. They all refer to Eastern Europe as their countries. It's like General Kavashnin told me in 1998 in Moscow, he said, you're taking our countries in Eastern Europe away from us. These are our countries and you're trying to sell weapons to them. And this is, this was the attitude. It wasn't just Putin. This is the representative attitude and that's why NATO was enlarged. You have to then think ahead. There were a lot of things that could have been done with Ukraine to have headed off a problem diplomatically, but we didn't. And Putin tried various means while he was the um, president of, the, so, of Russia to reel Ukraine in. Without Ukraine, Russia can't deal with China. And for Russia, China has always been the major preoccupation. It was Stalin's concern. It was the czar's concern and so forth. And so he has to have Ukraine back. He tried to put his own candidates in. He tried to uh, use the oligarchs. He used, he, nothing worked. Even seizing these two parts of Donbass and Crimea, these stubborn Ukrainians still stood up to him. And now the problem is that what would have been a logical solution of something like saying, oh, be like Finland. How can you say that to them when Putin's in there wrecking their country and, and killing people? On CNN this morning, there was an interview with an elderly Jewish woman, and she said to Putin, get out of my country, you bastard, leave us alone. When you have older women saying this, and this is a woman who survived World War II, you, you've got such a spirit in the country that it's not possible for the United States to come in there and say, now you boys, uh, let, let's just think this thing over. Now you need to sort of give up on Crimea and give away your country. And what they're gonna say is you didn't help us when we asked for it. So we've got to, we're, we're walking on eggshells trying to do this. And we're still left with the problem of Putin who wants to restore the Soviet Union. So it's not just Ukraine. Even if you could have forced Ukraine to accept the Minsk Accords, you would have had the problem of what about the Baltics? Uh, what about Moldova? What about all these pieces that were belonged, they're Russia's pieces, and he wants them back. So I think we're into a new era of diplomacy that we have to think our way through. It's unpleasant, we don't like it. This is not Iraq, it's not Afghanistan, we're not the big guy with the big stick, but we're still the most powerful power in the world. We're showing it economically. We have to think our way through it strategically. And we've got to be realistic about what the prospects are for Mr. Putin. I think a dictator, an autocrat who launches an aggressive war against an independent country that kills hundreds of people and wrecks a country and threatens the use of nuclear weapons, do we realistically think that we can give him an off ramp and say, okay, well, Vlad, you did a great job and we sure understand your pain. And uh, sorry about these Ukrainians, a million people left, but uh, they just didn't understand. I mean, it's gonna be very, very hard to put the genie back in the bottle here. I think, you know, we're into a new world and we have to think our way through it. I don't have the answers, but I sure see the questions. Any more questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, Baldas from BGD Holdings. Um, in general, thank you for your service. And I have been thinking about it partly through the lenses through which you have presented part of your thinking. There are points in times when you simply have to have a sense of being resolute. And I heard you, Professor, and I understand the fear. But in that fear psychosis, we are making certain assumptions. So you just continue to suggest, seed, make way, put up a resistance. But in the Situation Room, we think about it differently. I was thinking, why is it different from what very serious, good, patriotic people like Chamberlain thought and did? So back to the general's point about the age that we are entering, I think our leadership has a challenge, and that challenge is 
to tell its people to be resolute. Not just these simple economic sanctions, oil prices will go up when we put an oil embargo. All of that is a given. But the sense of being resolute to face down things you need to face down and not cower. Because you would seem to suggest that the Russian or so-called Mr. Putin, 10 feet tall, has no concern about tactical use of nuclear weapon because there will be no blowback. There will be no fallback. So I, I'm going with the general, uh, with the general's point of view that yeah. while we might not have answers, yeah. shouldn't part of our thinking change towards being resolute? Let, let's let uh, Professor Andres respond. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We should be resolute. We should be strong. We should, and the Russians are evil, and we're good. And this is wonderful for the press. And we should we should have this sort of thing going out you know, on the news all the time because we want the American people to be strong, but let's not think like that as leaders and strategists and pe decision makers, right? We are not about egos. We are not about Putin's ego versus Biden's ego and we have to fight to the last Ukrainian, right? This is not a question of who has a bigger missile, right? That's not what it's about. We're facing for the first time in a long time a major power with lots of nuclear weapons and with the cyber capabilities to take down our economy. We can do it. We know they can do it. They said they're going to do it. Now we need to find a modus vivendi where we can live and they can live, right? We have to respect them and we're not used to that. For the last 30 years we have been able to do anything we wanted. We could invade anyone we wanted. We knew we'd win anything, but we're not in that world anymore. So now, what are the limits on our power? What, where do we constrain our ego? Where do we constrain the, the moral argument, which we all believe in our hearts and want to fight for, right? We want the world to be democratic, and we really feel for the Ukrainian people. But we can't do everything. We're not powerful enough to do everything. So we need to make a decision. We need to think about where we and the Russians can come to a point where we can live without resorting to nuclear war or cyber war or something that, that where the cost is too high. Now, we, we did that, right? We did not admit Ukraine to NATO. We didn't, right? They wanted to, we could have done it, we didn't for a reason, because we knew that we couldn't push too far. We still know that. I suspect we will never and never intended to admit Ukraine to NATO. We never made a guarantee. We never said we would protect them. And we've come to a point now where we have hedged on that to the point where the Russians felt they needed to go to war. All right, no, the answer is not to be resolute and strong and moral and fight to the last Ukrainian or, or however this ends up. We need to find the off-ramp. This is gonna be painful, especially for the Russians. We need to make it painful for them, but not, not a question of egos, and we need to understand our limits, and we do need to find that diplomatic off-ramp that we can all live with. Yes. Perhaps I'm naive, probably, but why is there a problem not just saying Ukraine is not going to be in NATO? NATO was created for peace, and Russia is very small economically prior to the sanctions. So if the world wants peace, we are not at the beginning of World War II. We are uh, if anything, if people are looking at parallels, it looks to me like the beginning of World War I. So why can't we just say as an off-ramp, Ukraine will not be in NATO and, use, and then bargain from there, if that's what, as reported, Putin says he really wants? Could we start there? How do you react to that? Some kind of assurance to the Russians that we won't enlarge NATO well, to their border. Well, I think I think uh, practically Ukraine was not moving into NATO. I mean, you saw that over the years that uh, uh, the Europeans were reluctant to push the issue, particularly I think France and Germany put up some roadblocks. So in all practicality, I don't think it was an issue of NATO. I go back to what I said in the beginning of my opening comments, that NATO was more of a screen. The, the Russians, Putin wanted Ukraine. And even if NATO had never existed, uh, they would have gone after Ukraine. So it really, I think NATO is just 
an academic exercise for the Russians, quite frankly. Uh, I think I, I'd like to turn to something that both Richard and uh, Wes mentioned, and that is, uh, you know, how do you deal with foreign policy or challenges now in taking Wes's comments about um, tactical nuclear weapons? We are in a different world, absolutely, Wes. We're at the stage now where if we, we cannot look at this solely in the context of Ukraine and Russia, because right now, if we don't find a way out of this, Russia and put any country's name that has nuclear weapons into the equation can go anywhere they want and say, we're gonna do this. And if, by the way, if you don't like it, we're gonna use tactical weapons. So we're gonna be hostage from now on to these kinds of policies. So this is a real conundrum in terms of uh, getting this out. The, and I, you know, I, I agree with what Wes said in that respect. The way to have at least met some of this, I think right off was to impose com the, our complete range of sanctions. Because if we had hit them at once with all the sanctions, it wouldn't have given Putin enough time to think this through. And now as we dribble this stuff out, he's got time to think this through and react. If you had hit everything at once, he would have thought that maybe he could ride this out. But now as you dribble it out, he says, well, this is really hurting me. And now this is really gonna hurt me. It's time to say, hey guys, tactical weapons. And the way we'll do it is we'll drop one on Ukraine and, and tell the West, if you don't give up, uh, we'll drop another one. And maybe we'll even go further West. I'm being melodramatic here, but I wanna make a point here that we're, we're becoming hostage to our own policy by holding ourselves back in a non-military way, I think we, we've given more options and time for um, Putin to react and, and evaluate how to move forward. But we've got bigger problems beyond Ukraine in this situation. Can I, can I just uh, under, underscore something Roman just said? So it isn't really about Ukraine. Putin understood from the beginning and everybody told him, Ukraine's not getting into NATO. If it had been about Ukraine, you would have said, oh, oh, OK, 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 I'm happy with that. His initial sense of de set of demands wasn't about Ukraine. It was about rolling back NATO to take forces away from these countries that have sought NATO protection. When we began the NATO enlargement process in the 1990s, we offered Russia the chance to join. They did join Partnership for Peace, which was the precursor to NATO enlargement. But they didn't want to be part of NATO. OK, they weren't ready anyway. They weren't really a democracy. They had problems on their borders. They weren't ready. But we gave them out of respect because they were a major, major power. And of course, the other nuclear superpower, we gave them the NATO-Russia Founding Act. That was to give them the opportunity for consultation at any time on any set of issues with any NATO members or with NATO as a whole. And um, so they took the NATO Founding Act and their view was that that gave them a veto over NATO. And this is what is the residual of that. Putin wanted and still wants a veto over NATO. That's not a matter of respect. That's a matter of disrespect for the rules of international law and a rules-based international order. So as much as we might wish we could solve this by telling the Ukrainians to be nicer, understand you're never going to be in NATO, say it so Putin will go away. It won't solve the problem. And what I learned from my experience in the Balkans is that once Milosevic started the ethnic cleansing in Kosovo, there was no turning back to the original NATO plan, which was we'll put in some peacekeepers um, you know, we'll have the elections, we'll have good democratic government, it's still part of your country. Once he started killing these Albanians, there was no going back. Mm -hmm. When you kill people, you, they don't forget it. We found it again and again and again. And this in Eastern Europe is more of the same psychology. So we're not going to be able to force a marriage between Ukraine and Russia that resolves the tensions. We have to think our way through how we do this, but it's not our lives right now, it's their lives and their lives are in danger. Uh, General Clark, can I just follow up on that? Do you think that uh, 
Putin is proceeding deliberately or did he make an epic miscalculation? I think he had, he, this was a three-phase Russian plan as I see it. The first phase was the diplomatic run-up and squeezing the West to see if you could break NATO apart. Maybe those cowardly Germans would say that we need our oil and uh, who cares about the Ukrainians? Okay, NATO didn't break apart, thanks to the good leadership of the Biden administration in part. And um, he squeezed it as hard as he could. He then ran into the end of the window of effective military operations. There was no going back after he had 175,000 troops deployed there because everybody in Russia knew on the inside said, Vlad's gonna do this. And he did it. And so that's the second phase. Now, the second phase is also uh, has a diplomatic connection to it. So he's squeezing Zelensky. Pretty soon he'll offer to talk to NATO and they'll say, you know, uh, why don't you guys roll back so we can all, you know, live in peace together and, and take and do what I said. It's like negotiating with a pistol at your head. And that was the problem with the Minsk agreement for the Ukrainians. It's going to be a problem for NATO. His phase three is he's going to conquer Ukraine and then he's going to ride out the sanctions and he's going to use his conquest of Ukraine to destabilize the Baltic states, maybe Bulgaria, maybe Slovakia, maybe Poland is at risk. And he's going to force NATO apart because of the blowback of the economic sanctions on the West and on Germany. So we just are at the front end of this right now. We haven't hit phase three. We haven't even tightened the sanctions. Imagine we're still buying Russian oil and the Germans are getting Russian natural gas. After we cut off their central bank, uh, this is, it's really bizarre. We're only seven or eight days into this operation. So lots more is gonna happen. Uh, and he is on plan. He would have liked to have taken Kiev in the first three days, had Zelensky collapse, a little comedian. He calls Zelensky his little girl and makes fun of him. Zelensky's been a hero in this. He's been incredibly resolute. So now, according to Putin, the operation's still unfolding on plan. It's still on his plan. He's going to continue to squeeze this thing and keep us out. And he believes he will wear down Ukraine. That's, that's where it is. So it's a, it's a, we, there's no easy way out of the conundrum right now. Henry, you have a question. Yep. So um, it, it seems that if the uh, West um, squeezes uh, more sanctions to Russia, including uh, certain reductions in uh, oil purchases and gas purchases, and you're beginning to see that debate going on. Obviously, Canada already announced that they were not going to buy, but that was a small amount. Uh, Germany preempted uh, that, saying that they were not going to be willing to do that. But anyhow, so um, obviously, therefore, Putin feels like he's got a downside protection against increased sanctions all the way to, uh, to oil and gas purchases, and that is China, yeah, right? To the extent that... Um, that he gets into a bind, you know, and the economy is slowing down or collapsing, that China will bail him out. So can we get comments? You know, what's your take on the conundrum that China is in now as to what they do and whether they will continue with that uh, downside protection for Putin? Right? Richard? Yeah, China has, uh, has made all sorts of vague uh, statements of vaguely solidarity with Russia. When it comes to actually spending money, the Chinese have some very serious economic problems going on at the moment. I don't know that they will be able to help Russia very much. Uh, also, they don't want to appear to be helping Russia very much. So I don't think Russia will be able to accept, they won't be getting a lot of help from China. What I do worry about, is, which is a little bit different, is how the Chinese interpret what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, so. I'll just maybe segue just a little bit in a different direction and say that we have to make it absolutely 100% clear that we will fight for Taiwan uh, or else we have to make it clear that we will not fight for Taiwan. Right now, having this absolutely vague thing and leaving it up to the Chinese to figure it out is like that crossing the gully by you know, walking into the bottom or jumping into the bottom of it. This is going to make uh, 
China ask a lot of big questions, like will, will the United States really defend Taiwan or not? Uh, and that is a bigger problem, a much bigger problem than uh, the Ukraine. And I'll tell you, I think, my guess is, from what Biden has said, is that we will fight for Taiwan. We will. Uh, and so we better <laughs> deter the Chinese from invading. If that is what we're going to do, we better do it some way that convinces them. But no, I don't think that the Chinese will bail the Russians out uh, at the end of the day. General Clark, do you agree? No, I, I, I think Richard's right. I think it's going to be very hard for, first of all, China doesn't necessarily want to bail Russia, Russia out. Uh, there's uh, this whole business with China. China is a problem, don't get me wrong. But Putin manipulated Trump and the Americans and the Republican Party into making China a great immediate enemy at the and he did it by, I guess, at Helsinki and elsewhere saying, Donald, your problem's not Russia, it's China. And, and, and so America just jumped on it. And so China is torn. His economy is not that strong right now. He would like to have it both ways. He'd like to see Russia win, America humiliated. He'd like to get Taiwan. He's, he's watching carefully what's happening here. But it's not in China's interest to have a very, very strong Russia on its flank because China is going to take back that land in Siberia that the Tsar took 100 and some odd years ago. It's going to be theirs. And they know it. And they're both two, you know, behemoths playing each other off on this. The other thing is physically, it's not possible for China to take all of this oil. They got contracts, they're getting oil from everywhere. The pipeline's not big enough. Um, it, you know, it, given a couple of three years, yeah. But immediately, no, no, there's no, they're not going to do it. Maybe they give Putin a high interest loan and, 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 and mortgage it against the land in Siberia. China wants to win. They don't necessarily see themselves as helping Russia win. They see themselves as helping China win. Well, unfortunately, uh, we are out of time. Uh, please join me in thanking our superb panel. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with this distinguished group. And we wish you, you could join us for a drink, but I don't think we've figured out how to make that happen. No, and no, I've I, I got to get on CNN in 15 or 20 minutes anyway and, uh, and worry about the same things, but I really appreciate the dialogue. It's really helping me think through things and I hope it helps all of us because we do have to come to terms with this situation. I don't think it's gonna go away and we don't know what the right answers are, honestly. Thank you, General okay. Clark. Great. Thank you, Ambassador no, Papadou. No, thank you very thank much. You, very informative. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care.